So I'd like to, to next introduce Will. Uh, Will Bartlett is the head of research at GDA Capital. Will has been writing about technology in the future for, for over five years now um, and, and enjoys really much going deep diving into the different trends that will be playing out over the next few decades. Um, you know, he's been featured in some major publications regularly as a contributor uh, and really has some fantastic insights. Um, so, so I'm very excited for him to, to come on and, and, uh, and, and share some topics and perspectives. So um, Will, if you're here, free, feel free to take it away. Thanks a lot, Zach. Let me just share my screen. Can you see that? Zach, can you see that? You're good to go and we can hear you loud and clear. Perfect. Thank you. So yeah, today we'll be talking about disruptive tech in the modern economy. And uh, just as a note, I'm having an internet glitch. So if I cut out, I apologize, but it should be good. So as Zach introduced me, uh, We've already done that. So basic outline for today is we're going to introduce the modern economy. We're going to talk about some disruptive technology sectors and then close out with probably the most relevant thing, which is what can family offices do? So just starting off with like what the modern economy is. And it's really about in every economy, you have three real factors of production. You have labor, capital, and then you have technology or intellectual property like books or and copyright and things like that. And you need more of those inputs to scale more. And as we've seen with technology, it has potential for infinite scaling. And that's where we see tons of potential. And that's where GDA Capital is most interested. And it's the level of leverage that it allows that we are most interested in. And with that, we have disruptive technologies, which as one would guess, they disrupt the status quo and they sort of are a hard right on what we expect the future to be. They they change what we think is possible. And we define disruptive technology as anything that changes the way the world works. And this means how consumers are affected and just every industry that changes as you have with Uber or businesses that are disrupted or pretty much wiped out. And they're always superior to whatever legacy system was in place before. So as you can see with all the companies on the right, like even if you couldn't see the names, you would know these logos because they're omnipresent. They're everywhere, they're in our lives. And that's because of how scalable they've been and how scalable they continue to be. And what's most interesting about them is the idea that they're either negatively correlated or zero correlated. And zero correlation is most interesting because you're not necessarily hedging against yourself where if one thing does well, another does poorly you are actually in a position where you can be doing well with your traditional assets and do well with these zero correlated assets. And like an extreme example I would think of is no matter what time of year or what phase of the cycle we're in recession or boom, if a time machine was invented, that would do incredibly well. And you want to look for those things that would do well regardless of the economic status and are, um, and have that potential to massively blow up. And this is the venture capital ethos, and it's been um, it's been a growing idea in the world. And as it enters family offices, and they think about how they can hedge and do how they could perform better through Corona, which is sort of what the panel was talking about before. That's something we just want to talk about more and more. And so, quickly glossing over this, it's an idea you've heard time and time again: is that Bitcoin is pretty much zero correlated with stocks, with corporate bonds and with currencies, and that makes it perfect sort of bet to make that is zero correlated. And they're the perfect hedge towards traditional financial markets. And every eight to 12 years, we have a financial crisis or a disruption or a catastrophe in the case of this year. And in those times, it is best to look for a hedge that will serve us. So going to disruptive technology sectors, we isolated six different sectors of interest and they're just quickly the robotics space, biotech, AI and ML, quantum computing, and blockchain and distributed ledger technology where GDA specializes. And so looking at the Gartner hype cycle on the right, you really have mounting expectations for all of these and mounting expectations means that there's more money flowing in, there's more human capital flowing in. People are looking and like, wow, that's a good place to work as they leave university, as they look for the next phase in their life. And with that, we're seeing tons of advancement across the board. So jumping into the first 
disruptive technology, and that's robotics. And robotics is really the human capital of the modern economy. And it's going to be the new form of labor. And we already see it in the, like most famously, maybe in the Tesla uh, factory floor, where it's already being used to speed up production and meet growing deadlines and uh, production quotas. And even on the bottom right, you've probably seen the viral videos about Boston Dynamics is a humanoid robot or the dog robot. But the idea is that this is everywhere and it's something we've been expecting for a while since like, since like the Terminator movies, it's been an idea that there will be robots all throughout the world and uh, that'll change the way labor and delegation is done and make things more scalable. And so zooming out massively, we then have space technology, which used to really be dominated by NASA because NASA was the only one with the funds to invest in this, to make significant advancements here. And that's where you have like the Hubble Space Telescope and so on. But as we all know, like SpaceX has made ripples and we're starting to see SpaceX contract with NASA or contract with the International Space Station and all these other companies popping up. And that trend will continue as we get more advancement and even as we see like Space Force come out in uh, the United States, there's just more interest in space and it's emerging or the trend is re-emerging that space is the frontier that we want to be most interested in, even though we've come out of maybe 20 years of less action in the space. So probably the one I'm most interested in is biotech, just the manipulation of living organisms. And that's because it, there's a big scale that it works on. You have at the most common way that we've interacted with it so far is probably GMOs. Like we pretty much all consume GMOs and we have for a while. And on the extreme end, you have cloning and genetic gene editing, excuse me. And we're seeing massive amounts of money being put into that. Raises of hundreds of million dollars. And that especially applies to the CRISPR space, which is a gene editing software and technology that is said to have limitless potential. And it's really turned into almost like an arms race to who can capitalize it on the best uh, while also dealing with um, human rights issues and things along those lines. So next we have artificial intelligence and machine learning. And this is a term that may be almost overused at this point. Like you'll hear some people describe like Grammarly, the writing app is having AI, but the way we really think about it is that AI is about imitating humans. And then ML is more about image or speech recognition. And that eventually ends with the idea that like ro robots or the artificial intelligence can see or understand what it's seeing. And you have in the crypto space, the idea of oracles, which are able to transfer real world, real world data into not even text into data that they can analyze and uh, deal with on a large scale. And this sort of advent of smart machines is accelerating and we're seeing things like AI as a service. You have Amazon's product around that for the last 10, 15 years that they started for themselves and have now offered to everyone else, but also quantitative finance and then big data and analytics as that enters nearly every big company now is using that in some way in their marketing. So next you have quantum computing, which is probably the most aspirational of the whole group. It's all about creating like a computational power that is exponentially more powerful than anything we have right now. And we're not really there yet, but in the bottom right, I put in Atos Quantum's current strategy. And the idea is that even though we're not at the point where we have quantum computers, the discoveries along the way are increasingly relevant and can be monetized and sold and uh, in the same way that look at all the discoveries that came out of putting a man on the moon, there was so many steps along the way that changed how we live our day-to-day -day lives, but we haven't gone to the moon. We have benefited from the advancements along the way. And we're seeing pretty much every big conglomerate. I highlighted three here, Intel, Amazon, and Alibaba, and they're all investing hundreds of millions of dollars into this because they know that it is the future and has potential to pretty much allow them to dwarf all their other competitors. So finally, we have uh, blockchain and distributed ledger technology. And that's where GDA Capital specializes. And that's where we see just tons of potential for every company to incorporate blockchains and use it to help them run more efficiently and more transparently. And looking at the chart I put below where you have the total market capitalization 
for cryptocurrencies, you can sort of see it going through the Gartner hype cycle. It peaks, as we all know, at the end of 2017, goes up, and then we have spikes along the way, but now it's more of a steady rise to the point where it's around 367 billion in market cap and continues to grow. And I'm gonna gloss over this because I think that this has probably been talked to death, but just the idea that like Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies in general are decentralized, they're secure, they're borderless, and they're immutable. And these are all traits that will that provide not just a like a one to two increase in value, but more like a one to ten. Like it's a qualitative increase that allows everyone to benefit and trust in the system and reap more efficiencies. So what I think is actually the most important metric is the growth in wallets. Because you can look at growth in market capital, market capitalization, excuse me. You can look at that and see growth, but that could be a few whales, which means less. Whereas when you have more and more wallets every year at an exponential rate, that shows that we are heading towards mainstream adoption, which is very exciting. So I'm just gonna gloss over a few of the different types of tokens. Security tokens are like securities as one would expect. They are able to they represent equities, bonds, preferred shares, but it's basically about creating novel fundraising techniques and maybe avoiding the public markets, avoiding some of the regulations. And this is still in flux and being sorted out, but that's what also creates a lot of the opportunity. Then you have utility tokens, which are also issued by companies to allow for access to their platform. And you can think of this in the same way as you think of airlines reward miles, except if airlines rewards miles maybe had voting privileges or governance rights. But it's really the idea that to use our platform, you have to own our token. Next, you have asset back tokens, which is sort of like if you sort of like how the dollar originally was where the dollar was backed by a certain amount of gold for every dollar there was an amount of gold and we can have that now with the petro back dollar and so on stable coins are probably the most accessible of all the types of tokens because they they hedge for a lot of the volatility not hedge for a lot of the volatility they reduce a lot of the volatility that all the other tokens are experiencing and that makes them more palatable to the newcomer investor, the risk averse investor. And we're seeing the market capitalization continue to grow to the point where it's around 20 billion right now. And Tether, the largest stable coin is the third largest cryptocurrency by market capitalization. And as I said before, big features are no volatility, the rest is the same as cryptocurrencies, programmable, fungible, and efficient. And they can be backed by different things. So you have fiat currencies would be the most obvious one. And then you have commodities like gold or silver, and you have tangible assets, like real estate, and even economic indices. If you had an S&P uh, stable coin, what would that be? And so on. And I just want to highlight two different models of stable coins to show that they're not just a tether which is backed by the dollar and as stable as the dollar, like there are more novel uses. And first we have Axia, which is a treasury, treasury backed stable coin, which means that we have all sorts of different, to excuse me, all sorts of different assets behind it. We have real estate, we have commodities, we have currencies. And the idea is that you're almost forming your own central bank backed dollar, but with assets that you trust. And on the other hand, you have digital bits, which is creating a new network layer of stable coins where you can create branded stable coins on this network layer provided by digital bits. So the other use case, which is actually quickly speeding up is state backed cryptocurrencies. We have all these countries exploring the idea of making their own cryptocurrency, but most interestingly is China, which is going to leave about five years of uh, experimentation and is looking to implement likely in the next year. People are thinking late 2020, early 2021. So with all that, what can family offices do? And we just wanna highlight that it definitely looks to be early in the market and in the market cycle, there's tons of gains to be reaped and like regulations are still in flux. There's with this level of uncertainty, there's also a lot of potential for gain, but a lot of the crazy stuff has passed and we think we're hitting more of a steady and um, understandable phase in the market and industry development.
And the big thing there is that there's issues with all types of markets. In public markets, you have the amount of time and resources it takes to manage uh, SEOs and IPOs and stuff like that are just, it's a mess. And then you're giving away voting control and there's issues there. And with private capital, these have massive ticket prices, which means that a lot of companies aren't able always to raise money. And finally, we have companies like Spotify doing direct listings. You have Angelus doing equity crowdfunding. Basically, the market has shown that we're all looking for alternative ways to raise capital. So most excitingly, like what industries are already participating? And so last year, we heard all through the year and even this year about Libra, Facebook, stablecoin, uh, cryptocurrency. And that was a big move, not just for Facebook, but for the world, seeing that a big company was delving into the space. And then you have Polychain Capital moving to put about 307 million into their venture backed or um, venture focused fund. And just in the last two weeks, we have big companies like Square putting 50 million into their 50 million into their cash reserves and MicroStrategy moving 425 million into Bitcoin. And the idea is that Bitcoin is starting to be accepted as a good hedge and a smart move to have in their treasuries. So then you have Fidelity also as the largest brokerage in the world starting to offer its own digital asset services and custody solutions. And the custody solutions were only announced in the last two or three months and that's very exciting. And another point of legitimizing cryptocurrencies and blockchain. And so I'm just gonna jump through this. We have pretty much every big company. We have Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, ICE, KPMG, CFA, CFA Institute, New York Stock Exchange, and so on. Like everyone is making moves into the space, all of these financial institutions. And these are all votes of confidence that tell us that now is a very good time to be thinking about this, to be at least assessing your individual risk tolerance as a family office. And GDA Capital just extols the idea that basically to start asking the questions of what percentage are you willing to invest? What asset types are you comfortable with? What are your restrictions in terms of the lockup period, in terms of market timing? When do you have cash flow demands? And that'll determine how you would invest in the space. And all of this was just to say that over the course of this year, it's been <laughs> a bit of a mess. And how would you have changed your portfolio at the beginning of this year? And what disruptive technologies do you wish you invested in at the beginning of this year? And how can you position yourself so the next crisis that comes around, or even at the tail end of this crisis, that you are able to benefit? And, and yeah, thank you very much for your time. I don't think we have time for uh, questions today. Not right now, but, uh, but everyone definitely feel free to, to email will at gda.capital. Um, you know, I, I think that was a fantastic presentation, Will. I really appreciate it. I'm sure a lot of the attendees uh, gained some really interesting insights. Um, and, and I'm sure Will would be happy to share that to you guys uh, if you message him directly.